and a very warm welcome to all our viewers today uh, for our session where we will be unpacking Directive 8 and the associated PCC 55. Um, I do know that there's a lot of participants that are still busy entering into the um, into the session. So I think while they are um, entering, I'm going to, <laughs> I don't want to sound technologically challenged. We've just moved over to a new platform. Um, so if there's a little glitch here and there, or you see a screen that you shouldn't be seeing, I am going to apologize for that. But by the next one, we will definitely have everything um, well oiled. Uh, so, for those of you who maybe haven't attended one of our sessions um, before, I think you're in for quite a lot of information. Um, and the presentation that is going to be shared uh, today with you will be emailed out uh, and the video will be put up on, um, on the website. Uh, it will also be sent out in a link with your confirmations. There are unfortunately no CPD points um, afforded through the FIC. Um, but the presentation, like I say, will be made available and you will be able to um, look at the video at a later stage. All right, so I think I've rambled enough. We've got a lot of people now um, that have joined us. Uh, so my name is Ashley Moy. I'm responsible for guidance awareness here at the FIC, uh, and I'm joined by many colleagues um, sitting on this side of the table from, uh, from me today who are facilitating and assisting in the background. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention is you might be familiar with a different platform that we've made use of. So we normally make use of the Teams functionality. Uh, we've now moved over to, to WebEx and it really is part and parcel of, uh, you know, trying to, um, to develop um, and to, to reach out and engage um, more participants through uh, advanced platforms. With that, unfortunately, does come uh, learning so much as uh, you learn today, we also learn um, with different apps and, and technology. There are a, um, I beg your pardon, there is going to be a attendance register that has been posted. Um, Martin, I hear you. I'm sorry that it takes long to, to log in. Um, there is an attendance register that we ask that you please fill in your information. It is this attendance register that we're going to use. Um, and from there, we will be able to email confirmation of attendance. So please make sure that you fill it in. It is in the link. Uh, and then before we open the Q&A session, uh, it's a little bit sneaky that way, but we are going to be posting a questionnaire. The questionnaire is of vital importance for us, please. It's nothing against your name. Uh, no one's going to, to say, you know, this person got this mark or they didn't do well. Uh, it really is for us to have an understanding of the level uh, of engagement. Uh, whether these outreach programs are actually serving uh, the purpose and then also allows us to have an understanding uh, of different industries in terms of you know where you're at in understanding and complying with uh, certain obligations. So the questions are going to be very much associated to what we talk about in today's um, in today's session. So I think that's all the T's and C's and I'm going to get um, into into the, the session. So just bear with me for a second. I'm going to share um, share my screen and if I can maybe just check with our producers in the background um, if everything is okay. Ah, oh, that went so much easier than I thought it was going to, so fantastic. Right, so the agenda that we've drawn up and um, I'm going to try my absolute hardest to stick to it. It's just me chatting with you today, um, just providing a welcome and an overview uh, and this is um, what I've already done. I think we're, we're running well. Um, well in time. Thereafter, uh, just to start off with a legislative context and background, so I think for some of you it might be um, it might be information that you already know. We generally start our awareness sessions with this. Uh, for those of you who aren't really that afraid with uh, how the FIC operates or the international perspective, it's very important to put that into context for you, especially when it comes to this directive that has been issued because it is very much tied um, to a mutual evaluation finding, so not a grey listing finding, a mutual evaluation um, recommendation. Uh, and it also links to the facts of principle. So we're going to take you through the facts of principle and just explain uh, from a context perspective how I, um, um, you know, how this fits in. Uh, I'm then going to spend bulk of the session unpacking Directive 8 and PCC 55. Uh, and then we will open up for a Q&A session. So at this point, I'm going to pause because I do see quite a few queries popping up to say that they're not able to hear. Um, so I'm just going to check 
with my uh, producers if if the volume is okay. Yeah. All right. So I we've done a check. We do have people um, listening in on our side, and thank you to everyone saying that they can hear us. So I can only imagine then that uh, you might have a sound setting issue on your side. Uh, so maybe just, uh, and I'm really not that technical a person to be able to assist, um, but if you've got headphones or if your laptop is set to having um, headphones in, maybe plug your headphones in, plug them out. Um, but I'm, get, I'm getting a lot of people saying that they can hear me. So I'm gonna get started then with, with the session. Right, uh, some acronyms because us regulators do love us a good acronym. Uh, we are going to be using these acronyms throughout the session. So if you want to just quickly take a photo of it, I know you are going to be getting the presentation, but just so um, I have gone faint apparently. So I'm going to use my outside voice, <laughs> even though I'm inside. Uh, thank you to, to Michael who, who let me know. All right, so AML Anti-Money Laundering, LRA is the Labor Relations Act. We're really not going to talk about it, but it is... Um, it is relevant. Um, TFS is targeted financial sanctions. Uh, the TFS list then relates to the targeted financial sanctions list. Uh, FATF is the Financial Action Task Force. If I see is the FIC. Sometimes we call ourselves the center. Sometimes we call ourselves uh, the FIC. We're one in the same thing. Um, potato, potato, I guess. FOCA is the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act. PCC relates to public compliance communications. PF is proliferation financing. BCA refers to the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. RNCP, Risk Management Compliance Program. MLTF, so Money Laundering Terrorist Financing. And POCTA TARA is the one that no one can ever get right without having to look at it. Uh, and that stands for um, the Protection of Constitutional um, Democracy Against Terrorist and Related Activities. Amendment Act. Right. Uh, so let's get started then. So the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, they are a global international body. Um, and their purpose really is to promote policies and international standards when it comes to AML, CTF, and CPF. Now you'll see sometimes we refer to anti-money laundering, sometimes we refer to, to money laundering. The legislation is in place to, um, to, to put in um, controls and mitigants to lessen the likelihood of terrorist financing and proliferation financing. All right, so the, um, so I'm just going to pause. Uh, the sound is, is going haywire, it seems like. Oh dear. I don't, All right, let's try it for two more minutes. <laughs> now it's fine. I'm going to sit right on top of the screen. So if you're seeing like a close up of my face, uh, I do apologize, but I don't know how else to, to project any louder. All right. Um, so as part of uh, the FATF's um, uh, process in combating money laundering, terrorist financing, and proliferation financing, they've come up with what is known as the 40 recommendations. Now, these recommendations really talk to the controls and mitigants that you can put in place. Now, South Africa is a member of um, the FATF. Um, we're the only South Africa, I beg your pardon, we're the only African member of FATF. And that is actually quite significant, especially when you have a look, um, you know, at the media and, and what's happening around the grey listing uh, at the moment. There's 31 associate members or observers. So these are people who aren't necessarily members but they are in the process of becoming a member. Um, and then there's also regional bodies. So the regional body that South Africa belongs to is ISAMILAC, uh, and that is the Eastern Southern African Anti-Money Laundering Group. Now, what's important, and, and we always say, you know, the relationship between us and the FATF isn't that we've taken their 40 recommendations and plugged it into a South African context. Um, there really is a, um, an, an understanding and an interpretation involved where we need to have a look at what the international standards are and then bring that into a South African framework. So even though you will see that the 39 odd countries 
who are all FATF members, if you look at their legislation, their legislation isn't going to be identical. There are going to be nuances. It depends on, um, you know, the legislative framework, uh, whether you have a constitution, uh, what process it took in order for it to, um, to be implemented. Now, that's quite important when you're doing assessments. Um, so, very simply, part of the part of the process to be a member um, is you have to go through a peer review where there are representatives from other member countries. Now, what they would do is they would test against two things. The first one, they would test against the 40 recommendations, which I said a little bit earlier was kind of the, the, the fact of rule book, if you want to call it that, and what countries should have in place to make sure that they have a robust AML CFT framework in place. Uh, that is a, a technical test. So when they come in, they're going to have a look at our legislation. And I need to explain, it's not only the FIC Act. They didn't come and test the FIC. They came and tested South Africa's framework. Uh, so you would see that they had a look at different pieces of legislation, which is why we, we took you earlier through Dr. Tara and POCA and FICA. And there's a whole host of other pieces of legislation that are relevant. Um, so from a technical perspective, they had a look at all their recommendations and they check to see, do we have that in our framework? So technically, is it there? Then there's the next test. And the next test has to be around how effective is it? So is it actually making a difference? Uh, and this was referred to, um, the test rather is referred to as the test against the immediate outcomes. There's 11 immediate outcomes. And this then really tests the effectiveness. So you've got all these rules in place. That's great, tech, technical. But are they actually effective and are they serving the purpose in which it was intended? Uh, through the mutual evaluation process, we, um, we, I mean, you were aware we didn't do too great on it. Um, but the purpose behind the mutual evaluation is for them to go through everything and for them to tell us, listen, this isn't, this isn't in place. This is kind of working well. Um, it's a collaborative engagement. And then they come with a, a mutual evaluation report with recommended action items. All right, so I'm going to pause the discussion of the of the context there, and it is going to be relevant when we start talking about the directive uh, and why and what sparked the need to have the directive. So just keep in mind um, the, the purpose of the FATF, the purpose of the mutual evaluation. Um, yeah. In terms of the status of the um, the products. So if we're having a look at directives and guidance, now they there are products that still both go through a consultation process, but they have a different place in law. And I think that's very important to understand up front as well. So when we're talking about a directive, and I'm not going to read the sections, but there are specific provisions in the Act that um, that empower the FIC to issue directives. As part of that process, it has to go through a consultative um, uh, it has to follow a, a consultative process. We have to consider the comments and then it has to get gazetted. Um, <clears throat> the directive then essentially imposes a compliance obligation and non-adherence to it could lead to an administrative sanction. So that's for all directives that have been issued. We generally call it a um, an extension of the Act. And you will note that all the directives are very, very specific and it's a very simple requirement. Um, so it doesn't have to go through a, a, a parliamentary process to actually update the legislation itself. Then in terms of guidance and PCCs, so um, a guidance note or a public compliance communication, a PCC, is the same thing. It's got the same, um, the same status in law uh, in the sense that it doesn't impose an obligation. Uh, uh, if you're ever curious, and we do get asked this, sometimes a PCC generally is a um, on a very specific topic. So like PCC 55 is specific to um, Directive 7, whereas the guidance notes are a lot longer and they cover more broader topics. So for example, um, all, uh, all the reporting obligations would have a guidance product or a guidance note because there's so much to it. Uh, it covers a very wide range of information. Guidance also goes through a consultation process. We also have to take into account your comments and amend it. That's why you'll see that there's always a draft version, uh, and then it takes about two, three months, sometimes even longer, depending on the comments that we've received, uh, and then there will be a final version. Importantly, guidance does not impose an obligation. Rather, it clarifies a legislative intent, and it is authoritative in nature. 
So by that we mean there is um, uh, the, there are court cases where uh, guidance has actually been successfully used to confirm the fixed position on certain compliance matters. Okay, so let's get into um, the nitty gritties of it. I'm just checking for time. I think we're doing well on time. Uh, in terms of the PCC and the directive itself, just a little bit of um, background. So it was placed in the Government Gazette, uh, that is Directive 8, and it was supported by PCC 55 for all accountable institutions, and that was done on the 31st of March of this year. The directive and the PCC address a very particular shortcoming as part of the mutual evaluation process, uh, and that is with regards to recommend eight, I beg your pardon, recommendation 18, uh, which says that there are procedures regarding the screening of employees when it comes to hiring of new employees or existing employees. And we'll, um, we'll I'll show you now what the recommendation actually says. Uh, Directive 8 and PCC 55 need to be uh, applied in compliance with applicable labor laws and other existing laws. And the reason why we put this in here is because it touches on employment. So the FIC Act isn't a employment related act, um, but we also need to be cognizant of the fact that there's multiple pieces of legislation um, that could that this directive could potentially impact on. Uh, and notwithstanding um, what those rules are, this is an, ad uh, an addition from a money laundering and terrorist financing perspective and not necessarily from an employment perspective. All right. So he has just an extract of uh, the recommendation 18 and what is referred to as the interpretive note. So the way that the FATF recommendations works is it goes from um, recommendation one down to recommendation 40, and not every one of the recommendations have an interpretive note, but there is um, a good deal of them have a bit of an additional text to, to it. So the recommendation um, itself doesn't necessarily talk to the screening provisions. It talks about controls and processes um, and an instance where you're dealing within a group structure so if you read the recommendation, it's not going, you're going to ask yourself, okay, but why is this directive then applicable? You need to go and read the interpretative note. Now, the interpretative note refers to financial institutions, but from a South African context, uh, we take all accountable institutions into account. So what it says is institutions programs against MLTF should include the development of internal policies, procedures and controls, including appropriate compliance management arrangements, and adequate screening procedures to ensure high standards when hiring employees. And then it goes, goes on about you know, training of employees, um, having an independent audit function, which the FIC hasn't, um, uh, hasn't um, brought into the FIC Act. And then it goes down around you know, making sure you've got a compliance officer, um, et cetera. All right. So the purpose of the directive, then, if we if we link it back to um, what is required, you'll see that there's um, in an additional element um, that we've added when it comes to the scrutiny of employee information. Now, the two core objectives of the directive is to acquire or require the accountable institution to firstly screen prospective and current employees for competence and integrity, and the second one then is to scrutinise employee information against the targeted financial sanctions lists. So here we have two elements. So the, the key issue was around recommendation 18 and talking about employees. Um, it's always important to understand the why behind it. Uh, so when we are talking about um, uh, making sure that your employees um, are competent and have integrity, it really does relate to market entry criteria. So just as much as, um, as an accountable institution, you look at your clients and you look at the risk that your clients um, imposes. Likewise, an organization is made up of the employees. Your employees are making the decisions. They, they're the ones implementing controls. They're the ones potentially um, handing out the product or receiving cash or handing out cash. Um, and you don't want to be in a position where your employees can abuse you for money laundering and terrorist financing purposes or where you can facilitate um, terrorist financing. So that's kind of the, the, the thinking and the gist around making sure that those people who are um, um, the, the people making the decisions are not the criminals themselves. Okay. Um, so to summarize that very long-winded response, the purpose really then 
is to identify, assess, monitor, mitigate, and manage the risk of money laundering, terrorist financing, and proliferation financing. Okay. <clears throat> so the last summary slide then, just before we get into um, to the discussion of these elements. So you'll see that there's certain things that have been, been bold um, and, and uh, the colors, I think it's called Akra, but for me, it's just orange. Um, these are really the key issues and these are the issues that we're going to discuss in a little bit more, um, a little bit more detail. So first and foremost, the directive is for all accountable institutions and it creates a positive compliance obligation. What that means is um, it is a directive. Uh, it does hold a place in law. It is, <coughs> excuse me, um, it does provide an additional compliance obligation. So it is something that you have to comply with. Uh, accountable institutions must screen prospective employees and current employees for competence and integrity. And I think it's um, the, the reason we say prospective employees is while you're in the process of uh, recruitment, et cetera, before the person comes on, uh, you know, at that stage, they're a current employee. So it's two processes before they come on and for the, the employees that are in place. Um, a risk-based approach must be applied when screening employees. Employees needs to uh, be screened or examined through the TFS list, and there needs to be record keeping of all screening or scrutinizing. And I apologize, I see there's a horrible spelling mistake there that I didn't pick up. All right. Um, what I do want to mention, and I think this came through in the consultation feedback, um, is that there's already existing provisions in place that talk to um, targeted financial sanctions. And there's already provisions in place that talk about, um, you know, seniority of who your compliance officer needs to be. Now, again, we, we tie it back to, to the recommendation. We tie it back to the mutual evaluation finding um, that, yes, the provision might be in place for a compliance officer to have, you know, the necessary um, seniority, uh, but that, that's not sufficient and it doesn't meet the FATF standard. Um, likewise, with the uh, targeted financial screening, there's already a provision in place that says no person may um, uh, provide financing or assist in any way a person on a TFS list. And it's only accountable institutions that have a reporting obligation in terms of their clients. So there's existing provisions in the Act, and you'll see that the wording in the directive is very, very much aligned. Um, to the TFS provision. So if you look at section 26, capital A, B, and C, um, and also in terms of section 42, when it talks about the compliance function, and that was deliberate. So because we know that you are already applying a lot of these tests, uh, the risk-based approach, and a lot of the methodology uh, already to your clients, uh, the thinking is, you know, those, those processes can equally be applied to your employees. All right, so we didn't want to make something completely brand new um, with completely different rules. So it really is aligned. So when we talk about risk-based approach, um, I always have a joke at the end of these um, sessions, if you can count how many times I've said risk and you take a shot, you'll be calling out. Um, but really risk is, um, you know, it underpins the FIC Act. Uh, it underpins uh, the directives. It underpins the guidance product. Um, and it, it really is there to make sure that you understand the higher risks and you apply the, the controls and the mitigants to those higher risks. Uh, there's no such thing as a, you know, a blanket one size fits all because that's not going to be an effective use of your time nor your resources. So much like with your clients, uh, not all empl employees will pose the same level of risk. Um, and that talks to you know, the role the employee will pose. So, um, you know, if, if you have, and I know we're going to talk to it in a little bit of detail just now, but think about it, a person who uh, can actually create a strategy, a person who signs off on your clients, a person who can, um, you know, vet a client and say, okay, this person is a very low risk from a money laundering perspective. These are the people who can actually manipulate um, your, your organization and can, can manipulate the, client, the types of clients that you can take on board. So that's why we're saying not all employees pose the same risk, not because the guy next to you looks dodged. Um, that, that's a different discussion for another day, but it's really around the role that a person, um, person has. Okay. Uh, so when you're talking about the level of risk that a person poses, uh, it needs to be determined upfront 
and ensure that their screening applied is proportionate to the level of risk that that employee role presents. All right. So if you have an onboarding team for argument's sake versus if you have um, your, your board of um, directors um, or you might have a, a audit committee or a compliance committee that signs off on, on politically exposed persons, you can see already um, that the decisions made at those different levels could potentially expose the organization to abuse. Where the accountable institution identifies a higher risk based on the employee role, they then in turn need to apply more stringent competency and integrity screening. All right, much like with clients, like the higher the risk, you know, the, the more questions, the more um, enhanced due diligence that would be applied, it's the same principle. An accountable institution must take a risk-based decision to make sure that the risk is mitigated and managed based on the outcome of the screening of the prospective um, and current employees. So very importantly, this isn't a tick box exercise. It's not to say, okay, you now need to go and, and screen them. I've screened them, but I don't even look at the results. Or I look at the results and I can see, listen, this guy's incompetent for this particular role, um, and then you do nothing about it. We're not, <laughs> and the, the guidance is um, also very silent on the matter because we're not telling you um, what you need to do, but you need to be aware of the results and you need to understand what is it that you can do? What are the controls that you can build into um, uh, you know, your existing AML processes that could potentially mitigate these risks. Okay, so then let's pause a little bit on um, competency. So when we're talking about competency, uh, and we always say wherever something isn't necessarily defined, the dictionary meaning is always the best place to go. And it's, I can assure you it's um, as a draft, it's the first place that I start um, to understand exactly what the word means. Now, when you're looking at competency, uh, the competency really talks to, you know, are they competent? Can you actually do the job? Um, do you have enough knowledge? Do you have the skills to do it? Do you have the expertise to do it? And this is very relevant, especially the higher up when you go in an employee role. So if you are at a, a potentially lower end, um, that sounds horrible to say, but I mean, not a senior staff, a more, joint, a more junior staff, who's maybe processing or you know, doing document collation, but they're still part of that AML process. The, the skills required for that role um, aren't necessarily what is required for your money laundering and reporting officer um, or potentially the, the head of your fraud risk unit who are signing off on your um, high risk clients or your politically exposed clients. So there's definitely a, a different level of skill sets required and it's against that in which you would need to test. There's, of course, flexibility in the way in which you will screen for competence. Uh, and again, it's based on your risk-based approach. <laughs> we have provided some examples, but we really need to explain that these are not all the examples. There's, and we're not labor relations experts. Uh, we're not HR consultants. Uh, and I really think this is probably the, the best relationship that you can have um, in applying this PCC um, is going to your, your HR units, understanding what they already have in place, uh, because I'm sure most of you are already doing this in some form. Uh, okay, I digress. So some examples then, uh, you can look at your employee's previous employment history, uh, get employment references, qualification checks, um, look if there's relevant accreditations. Um, and it's, it's interesting because when we were looking at this, uh, we looked at existing practice. We looked at our own practice as well. Um, you, you know, even though we're not an accountable institution, as an organization, we definitely do competency checks, integrity checks, screening checks. So we had a look um, at our job descriptions. Uh, there's a specific section there that says what are the required skills. So some of them would be um, um, like non-negotiable. So these are the ones that you have to have. And then you get those skills that are nice to have, all right? Um, and then also likewise for qualification there's a minimum qualification that's required. So it's already in practice, it's already there. Please don't see this as something completely new. Have a look at what you're already doing and how this can align, um, align to that. And it's really the test to how do I prove someone has the skills? How do I know you have the knowledge? How do I know you have the expertise, okay? And it can differ from different levels. So this role of a junior staff has a very different requirement um, to a board member for argument's sake. Then when you're talking um, integrity, 
So integrity then talks to two core principles, and this is around honesty and morals. Now, I know <laughs> these lines can, can also be very um, blurred and they can also be very wide, but what we're reminding people of is we're talking specifically to um, honesty and, and moral principles in relation to uh, money laundering, terrorist financing, proliferation financing. So again, we don't give you all the examples, but we say some of the examples that you can have a look for um, is if there's potentially any criminal record in relation to crimes of dishonesty, um, money laundering, or any other form of um, financial crimes. And again, in many organizations, like how, you know, when I got employed at the FIC, I had to go to the police station and I had to do my fingerprints. I had to wait for security clearance and vetting. Um, I had a background check done on me. Um, so it's, it's again, it's existing processes. And this is what integrity talks to. It, it, talks, it talks to um, the risk element of what is the likelihood that the person in this role, yes, he, he might be competent, he knows what to do. This is a different test. This is what is the likelihood that this person might actually abuse my organization to facilitate money laundering, terrorist financing? Could they easily be swayed by an outside person? And that's where things like crimes of dishonesty, um, financial crimes are relevant, because that's the test here. Are they or do they have the ability to abuse? Okay. I know in the consultation process, and, and um, you know, if there are any questions, it's, it's, a, it's such a difficult um, thing to talk about. I do understand uh, there are lots of questions about what happens if I, um, they've got a um, found drunken driving or um, domestic violence. So as, as part of your organization, and again, that, that's why I say talk to your HR division around this, you'll, th that's something different. That's not a test, uh, and that's not what we're looking for when we're talking about uh, integrity from an anti-money laundering terrorist financing perspective perspective. If those are rules that you have in place, then those are rules that you have in place. Okay. All right. Um, then he's going to talk now about enhanced screening. So just a, a reminder when we said earlier that um, you have to follow a risk-based approach, you have a look at the role of the employee, um, and based on the role of the employee, you would then identify which one of these roles have um, a higher risk uh, associated to them. And again, a higher risk in terms of um, could they abuse us as an organization to to be a facilitator. All right. So what could that mean? That could mean um, signing off bad deals. It could mean um, turning a blind eye to a very, very high risk client or signing off a high risk client, changing a status on a system. Um, it could be, um, you know, approving um, PEPs that shouldn't have been approved or right. Um, okay, so the additional screening measures, once you've identified that this particular employee role is a heightened risk, uh, there's then a call for an enhanced screening for integrity. Now, this can include, and again, it's not an exhaustive list. These are just some ideas uh, that we have seen in practice. Um, enhanced screening could include um, how have they conducted themselves in terms of general accepted conduct requirements applied by the accountable institution. So remember that this is um, could be for prospective and it could be for existing um, employees. Uh, do they hold or have they held a senior decision-making role in relation to AML, CFT or PF at an accountable institution that was then found to be um, in contravention of either the FIC Act, POCA or POCTATARA? And there again, I think you can see the element coming in of what we're trying to get at when we're talking about financial crimes. Okay, two last things that you can also consider from an enhanced screening for integrity perspective. The first one relates to known close associates, immediate family members of a high risk client. Uh, that's why I made the point earlier about you know high risk PIPs or foreign PIPs. And let me just pause there and I'm checking for time. I can pause, we've got lots of time. Uh, why is this relevant? So if you think about it, and this is, Again, we try to tie it to an existing principle that's in place. So if you look at Section 21 um, F, G, and H of the Act, it talks about uh, domestic PEPs, foreign PEPs, uh, and politically exposed persons. 
There is a PCC, um, PCC 51 on politically exposed persons as well. Um, and we're also busy with a one on beneficial ownership. But the reason why persons associated to a high risk are also of concern is think about it this way. If I've done something bad or if I've got um, you know, illicit funds in my possession, I'm not going to be the one who goes and buys the car. I'm not going to be the one who filters the money through my bank account. I mean, you could be, but chances are you're not going to be because people know who you are. People, um, especially if you have a criminal record already, people are going to suspect it and you are going to be under enhanced scrutiny because you are a higher risk. So what do I do? I give it to someone who doesn't have a bad name or who isn't considered a high risk um, because they have a lesser scrutiny. Okay, so it's a very common behavior, um, much like also, you know, the abuse of uh, corporate structures. So it's for this reason that we say those that are close or those that are associated to you also need to be um, considered, a, um, you know, when you're having a look at someone's profile. All right. Uh, the last one then is if you're a national of a high risk terrorist financing or proliferation financing um, geographic area. Now, just like with any other discussion, when we talk about high risk persons, I really want to caution everyone that the act doesn't say that a person who is a high risk is a criminal. A person who is a high risk is a bad person or is going to do something. It really is a test, a risk based test where you know how to apply your resources to there where the risk is the, the greatest versus where the risk is the lowest. So if an employee role is determined to be a high risk, please, you know, there's no, there's no branding. It doesn't make any person bad. It just means that there has to be an enhanced scrutiny because the very nature of the role, it's the nature of the role um, that is acceptable to abuse. All right. Okay. So when we're talking about employee role considerations, and I, I think I've spoken quite a, quite a bit around, you know, different roles and different interfaces from a money laundering and terrorist financing perspective, some of the roles that can be considered as a heightened risk, and again, these are examples. They aren't necessarily, um, you know, the end all and be all. There might be different scenarios in your organization. So firstly, um, senior management. And this includes any uh, employee that sits within committees that approve the establishment of business relationships or single transactions with high risk clients, such as um, politically exposed persons. Any category of employee, and this is important that you need to understand how your, um, you know, your staff setup is, uh, where the employee may take decisions which alter the AML, CFT and CPF regime of the entity. And this is very significant. And what I would like to caution people here is, please do not think that a person in a junior role um, doesn't have the ability to change a regime. All right. I think sometimes people underplay the essence and the critical role um, of junior staff and overemphasize um, senior staff. All right. So um, people who can change bank account details, people who can... Um, sign off clients, people who have administrator rights that can change stuff in the background, can alter um, the results of your um, of your controls. Okay. I don't mean to scare anyone here, but it's just these are the things practically that you can um, that you can consider. So when do you have to do it? Now the directive uh, uses and it intentionally uses the word periodically. So that means it's an ongoing basis. And that also ties in the principle of risk-based approach. It ties in very much with the principle of your onboarding of clients. So yes, you get a client. It doesn't mean that that client's risk is going to stay the same for the duration of your um, uh, business relationship. Exactly the same principle can be applied to your employees. The role might morph over time. Um, the, the role might require different um, knowledge set, set or skill sets if they move from one role to another role. Um, and also, um, you know, if Anything, anything can happen. You can be an employee for 10 years and within the 10 years, you could have done a financial prime or whatever the case may be. So it's, it, it can't stay the same. And that's why we, we refer to an ongoing basis. Uh, accountable institutions therefore must screen all prospective employees for competence and integrity before their appointment. And then afterwards as current employees must also then be screened on a periodic basis. Okay. In terms of the frequency, so the frequency really is determined by the risks posed. 
And it also depends on the trigger events. Um, so, for example, an employee who has a higher risk needs to be screened more frequently than uh, an employee role with a, um, a lower risk. Um, there's one more slide on that. There we go. Uh, and where this, um, where they do present a heightened risk, the the guidance says then at least or by a minimum they need to have um, on an annual basis be screened. So those are for your your um, higher risk employee roles. Okay. Uh, I spoke about trigger events. So trigger events um, is anything significant that changes. Uh, so if you had a onboarding team that is only responsible for um, I don't know, capturing client data. Now, all of a sudden, you know, through a restructuring or whatever the case may be, the role itself actually changes. Um, they now have access to different systems. Um, that's a trigger event because now what you've tested the role against is no longer the same. All right. So these are just, again, some practical things um, that you can think about. Um, your frequency should be reported. Um, well, it must be reported, but where it should be reported. Um, it's the, the FIC strongly recommends that you put these procedures into your RMCP. Uh, current employees are not exempt from um, being screened. Uh, and this we just put in here because, again, it was um, a, you know, a comment we received quite a bit um, through consultation. Um, and former employees obviously don't need to be. They've, they've now left. You can't, we can't expect you to now go back and, um, and have a look at those that have left. All right, so that takes me then to the end of the discussion um, when we are talking about um, competency and integrity. Now we're moving on to the second, um, the second part of the um, of the directive and the PCC. Here you're not going to see or hear me talk that much about risk. So risk is also relevant, um, but from a competency and a screening, uh, I beg your pardon. A competency and integrity perspective, it is the most relevant because it's based on who the employee is, is going to determine, or role rather, is going to determine how you go about doing it, when you do it, et cetera, et cetera. From a, a scrutinizing of employee information against the targeted financial sanctions list, this is a little bit different. This becomes a very, um, it's an objective test. Either you're on the list or you're not on the list. It's, it's, really, that, um, it's really that simple. Now, before a accountable institution appoints a person, they need to scrutinize or prospective employees against the list. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, accountable institutions must also scrutinize all current and existing employees as and when updates are made to the list. And the scrutinizing of the information applies to all employees. So again, I said this one doesn't really talk that much about risk because all employees, irrespective of the level of the risk, needs to be screened against the targeted financial sanctions list. Now, this is a free list. Uh, it is available on the website. It is um, um, updated as and when there is a change to the United Nations sanctions listing provisions. Uh, it, it's, it's freely available. You can search it for free. You can download the audit trails. There needs to be record keeping. So record keeping in the sense that, yes, I went and did the search. These are the results, all right? And that needs to then be kept. You can also download this. So if you don't want to, um, you know, go into the system every day to, to do it, you can download it. But you also need to bear in mind that the list changes. What's important, and that's the, the point where it says um, whenever a list changes, you need to check if your existing staff are not on that changed list. We do have a free um, subscription service that is available on the website. Um, where you can go onto um, the international tab on the website and you can subscribe to the TFS alert notifications. So you should already be receiving these, um, whichever compliance officer or money laundering compliance officer uh, is registered with the FIC receives these. It's an automatic subscription. If there's anyone else, so if you want um, your HR department to assist you with this or your facility or whoever, um, in the organization who needs to assist can register for free for the subscription service uh, as and when they receive that they have a look at the name if they know that name isn't an employee then they've done what they've needed to do um, for the existing staff all right so 
it's actually very nice for us to say you don't have to go and pay for this. It's for free. You can use it on our website. All right. So why? Why did we bring this in? Um, it's already an existing provision I spoke about in terms of Section 26 A, B and C of the Act. Uh, so Section 26 B of our Act says that no person may provide economic support, financial or other services to any person who is listed on a targeted financial sanctions list. Um, all current employees at the time of the directive must be scrutinized against the notices that have already been issued and former employees then don't need to be um, considered. Now, I know I mentioned a little bit earlier and it's maybe worth repeating as an accountable institution, you are doing this for your um, for your clients already. Uh, you then have a reporting obligation for your clients. That is not the case when it comes to employees. The, the directive doesn't impose um, a reporting obligation. Okay, so uh, the commencement date, when does it come into effect? So it was gazetted on the 31st of, um, 31st of March this year. It came enforceable the date that it was published. And that's quite important uh, in the sense that um, all your client, or oh, I beg your pardon, all your employees at the time um, of the 31st of March needs to be um, scrutinized and screened. Okay, It's applicable for both current and prospective employees. So how do you go about tackling this? I can understand some of you might have four employees um, or might all be family, so you kind of know already everyone's business, uh, or you might be a very large organization with you know, over a thousand, um, you know, a thousand employees. So the way that um, the FIC recommends that you um, tackle it and again, in the spirit of a risk-based approach, is start with your higher risk employee roles with your current employees as soon as possible. Again, this was um, in March. And thereafter, focus on your lower risk employee roles. Okay. Non-compliance. So what happens if you do not comply? Um, failure to comply with the directive is, uh, can result in imposition of an administrative sanction. And that is then in terms of Section 45C of the FIC Act. And that again then just talks to the nature of a, a directive. It creates a positive obligation, which means you have to do it. Failure to do it could lead to um, a penalty. Okay, so I think um, yeah, we were very generous with time today, and that is um, pretty much it for the presentation. Um, the last slide that I just want to show you is you know we do have a, a call center. Um, we do have a, a public query portal. Um, we ask that you please, um, there is no email address, but it is on the website. Um, it's, there's the link available for you. All right, so that's that's it for the presentation then. What I am going to do, just bear with me for a second. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to move over to the, um, the questions for one minute uh, for me just to be able to pull up all your questions. Um, so I will be with you very shortly. I'm gonna just stop my video so that you don't have to look at me blankly staring at my screen. Um, Sorry about that. That was um, Michael. You might have met him on Tuesday when he did the presentation. Um, I am struggling just to find the questions. So I do see them, but I see them like yay small. Um, but I am going to try my hardest to go through the questions for you. Um, <clears throat> all right. So first and foremost, I've been asked by the producers, please, will you uh, click on the link uh, to the attendance register? Um, we do see 1,600 people have joined our session today, but we don't see 1,600 people's names on the attendance register. So it would be very helpful, please, um, if you could just fill in the attendance register. 
let me cover all the T's and C's. Uh, I see there's a lot of questions um, around the video from Tuesday. So the video from Tuesday is up on our website. Um, it is on YouTube. So if you um, please type in Financial Intelligence Center, because if you type in FIC, you're going to find what you're looking for. Um, and there the, the uh, presentation is there. For anyone wondering what we spoke about on Tuesday, that we spoke around um, Directive 6 and 7. Yesterday was the due date for Directive 6. We haven't closed the portal. I'm going to say it again. We haven't closed the portal. So if you haven't had an opportunity to submit the directive, if you were looking and you needed help for the, the YouTube video, please go have a look at it uh, and submit that return uh, as soon as possible. You will get the presentation uh, from today. It will be put up on YouTube. Uh, I know it used to take us about a month or two months uh, to upload our videos, but now that we've moved over to a new platform, it can take two days. Um, so yeah, the, the video is available. Um, I'm just getting past all the comments that you couldn't hear me earlier. I do apologize, everyone. And uh, I do see there's some very helpful comments here um, of people trying to troubleshoot on our behalf. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That's actually very, Shana's very sweet. Okay. Um, apologies, everyone. I'm scrolling, 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 scrolling frantically. So I'm going to maybe try to start from the bottom up, if you don't mind. So otherwise, I'm never going to get to the, um, the technical queries. Um, still some comments about not finding the attendance register. Um, I think it was just shared again, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So if, um, if you look from a mail from Michael, um, Michael posted for us. Sorry, I'm not frozen. I'm just trying to get to the question. There we go. He has a first question. I hope I can answer it because I haven't been able to screen it yet. Uh, how would the screening of employees take place for attorneys as there's very limited number of employees that have access to company financial um, dealings? All right. So I think this is a very relevant and a very important question. And that's when we, we talk about understanding the role of the employee. So if you're having a look um, uh, from a, an attorney's perspective and you've done your institutional risk assessment and you understand which are your particular um, service offerings or product offerings uh, relate to a heightened risk, um, any employee that deals with those particular activities, I think would be also a very easy gauge um, to determine where a potential heightened risk could sit. So when we talk, um, you know, transaction, um, a transaction in the attorney space might be a very different transaction to a motor vehicle dealer or to a bank or to an estate agent. All right. So when you're talking about um, access to that, you're talking about those people who, um, you know, engage with the client, who um, do the risk assessment for the client, who determine the client's risk profile. Um, so from that particular, um, you know, where they fit in, uh, also within your organization, if you do get a high risk client, who in that organization is responsible to approve that high risk client? All right. So again, that talks to, um, and, and, and why I say the two processes are so linked, because you need to have a look at how you are dealing with your clients. How are you risk assessing your clients? Who makes those decisions? So who signed off your RMCP? Who created your RMCP? That is going to be a person who potentially has a heightened, or an employee role rather, that has a heightened risk because they've determined your AML framework for your organization. If they decide to change your risk matrix to make all um, um, politically exposed persons low risk off the bat, that can change your framework. So it's not necessary around having access to financial statements per se, um, but around um, what their influence is and their control is in terms of having um, um, frameworks in place in your organization. Okay, um, there's another one. Um, is social media <laughs> is social media an option for integrity screening with employees? 
uh, and would pokey would there be pokey implications i can't answer you about pokey implications to be honest i'm not a um i i I know enough to pass a test, but I don't know enough to answer it in an open forum. Um, when you're talking about um, integrity, the test for integrity, when we spoke about integrity, um, you know, it's talking about morals um, and it's talking about um, honesty. Uh, and again, it needs to be read within the context of money laundering, terrorist financing. Uh, so this might be relevant for something else. So I know exactly where you might be coming. Boss, I'm sick, but I, I saw you, um, you know, at the pub around the corner. Uh, yes, it definitely talks to integrity, but it doesn't talk to the integrity in relation to, um, you know, uh, countering your, your, your company's money laundering policy. So I don't think I actually gave you an answer at all, um, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm just seeing questions for the attendance register. All right, here's another one. Um, oh gosh, you called the call center and waited half an hour. Um, I will take a note of that to to who messaged. Um, if a, if a former employees are still part of a company retirement benefit for argument's sake. Would that not still count as financial assistance? I, th I think that might be from a, um, a scrutiny perspective. And that is actually a, I mean, I'm not going to lie, Marianne, that's something that we didn't consider um, as part of the, the consultation process or the comments. Um, my understanding of this, though, is it would be held with the, um, the FSP. So once you've come into a, a group scheme, um, yes, it's, it's obviously in your, your company's name, um, but those those reviews would have been done by the accountable institution as well. I'm actually going to note that because that's a very interesting point that I can be very honest. Um, we, we didn't think of. So we don't know every. Okay, I represent a small subsidiary in South Africa. Our compliance is completed in terms of the. Oh gosh, I went missing. Um, I don't know what I did. I passed your question and I think that was a very interesting one. Let me see if I can get it back. There we go. I represent a small subsidiary in South Africa. Our compliance is completed in terms of the EU regulations and we use company. Do we need to redo the check in the South African subsidiary? All right. So again, it's, it's a very interesting question. Uh, there is a principle and also in the recent amendments um, to the FIC Act. So if you have a look at the provisions um, under the RMCP, and I'm going to just maybe read it out to you. Um, these were the changes that were made uh, on the 31st of December of last year through the General Law Amendments Act. And this talks to when an organization falls within um, a group structure. Um, so it says here, so it's section 42.2Q, if you if you ever want to go read it up, um, how internal, so as part of your RMCP, these are one of the controls that needs to be in your RMCP, how internal branches handle the exchange of information and confidentiality of information, uh, group-wide RMCPs, especially SDR analysis, and then also um, 42 2QA, uh, how will, how the council institution will apply additional compliance if the host country doesn't implement the FIC Act must be included within the RMCP. So the reason I'm reading that is section 42.2Q and QA talks about what happens if you are in a group structure. So whether you are, um, um, you know, South African structures within the structure or you have a foreign branch or you are the foreign branch, the minimum standard is the South African standard. So if your organization um, is an EU, uh, organization and their rules are very much aligned to our rules and it's already been done according to their um, processes, uh, then yes, you've already done the test. If their definition, for example, uh, of a politically exposed person is different to our definition of a politically exposed person, then obviously you need to apply our definition as a minimum standard. Okay. So again, let me just repeat, the FIC Act is the minimum standard. If your company standards, whether it be um, um, within the organization or within the country or outside of the country, whichever leg that you sit on um, and their rules are different. 
if their rules have um, are more enhanced and have more, then obviously you would have to comply to that because of their country rules. If their rules are less, then you would have to do additional to make sure that you meet the minimum standard of the FIC Act and all associated directives. So I hope that's um, that answers the question. Okay. Um, what is considered a prospective client? Um, will it be everyone that comes for oh, a, a prospective employee? Would it be for everyone that comes for an interview? Well, only those that you sorry, <laughs> only those that you would consider for employment after you have conducted um, the interview. I think that's a very good question. Uh, definitely, if we're aligning it to the same principles, just like how you deal with the prospective clients. Uh, it's before you engage or before you uh, enter into that business relationship or transaction. That's the principle that's applied for a client. Likewise, when you're dealing with employees. So before you, before anyone signs any contracts or anything, I would suggest um, that you know you do these relevant checks because you might have to make a decision. Um, you know, if if the person's already signed, I'm just saying what the consequence could be of not doing it that way. Uh, if the employee already signs the contract uh, and you only do it um, the next day and as part of your risk process, you decide, oh, looks, we don't actually want to take this person as an employee because the risk is too great. Now you, you're in a little bit of a situation because you've already signed contracts and then you might have to get lawyers involved, et cetera. So a very strong recommendation before they start employment um, means, you know, before you do any contract signing, et cetera, et cetera, and not at the point of interviews. You first need to know and suss out the people first, and then you can start asking them your um, employee onboarding questions. And I think also from a practical perspective, it's not going to be so awkward. Um, I know what we do in, in our interview process um, at the FIC is we actually do ask this question um, as part of the, um, you know, the last questions that we ask. And it's always, do you have a criminal record? Um, do you have uh, any judgments pending? So it's, it can you can link it to your interview process if you want, um, or you can leave it, but definitely before they start employment. Okay, uh, one of our employee spouses was a chairperson of an international sports body. Does that make them a PIP or a PIP by association? All right, so I'm going to check now the the schedules to see if they if they meet the the definition of a PIP or a PIP. But what I do want to say is, um, as a general principle, even when you're dealing with um, a client or if you're dealing with an employee, the person who fulfills the position that's identified in the schedule is considered a politically exposed person. Close known associates, um, family members, et cetera, are not considered to be a PEP. However, they are considered to be a close known associate um, or family member. And I know it sounds pedantic, um, but it, there's a, a relevant distinction in terms of um, in terms of law. So if you are a PEP, there are additional scrutiny. And, and again, this is for a client. This is not for an employee. And there is additional scrutiny that the Act requires. Uh, if you are a PEP or if you are a, a relative to a PEP from an employee perspective, there isn't really those additional other than the enhanced due diligence. Should that PEP be considered a high risk? All right. Um, so let me have a look at the definitions quickly for you um, of a politically exposed person. Uh, I don't have it on that page, but it's so I have got my book in front of me. It looks a little bit worse for wear, um, but it helps because I know exactly where to to find what I'm looking for. So your question was specifically a chair of an international sports body. Um, let me have a look. So I'm looking at um, the, the schedule. So schedule 3A, 3B and 3C. 3A talks about um, domestic PEPs, uh, so those persons holding positions within South Africa. Um, 3B talks to foreign politically exposed persons, um, and then Schedule 3C talks to um, prominent influential persons. Uh, important to note that it does make reference to a, um, um, a value that needs to be set by, um, by the, um, the Minister of Finance, and that hasn't yet um, commenced. All right. So if you're talking PIPs, so it's a politically influential person. And here they say it is um, a position of a chairperson of a board of directors, uh, audit committee, executive officer, or chief financial officer of a company defined in the Companies Act that provides any goods or service to an organ of state 
at an amount as agreed by the minister. So I'm not seeing, and, and I, I don't know the person, I don't know much about how that fits in, but hopefully that can help you to try ascertain if, um, if, if that position fits the, the definition in the schedule. Okay. Um, Um, all is risk based. So, if we have an employee who is of higher risk but not guilty of anything, what is the recommendation of handling the employee? This cannot just let them go. How does this tie in with the Employment Act? So, definitely, and, and thank you for that question because at no point in the directive or the PCC um, do we even vaguely say what you must do once you've identified it. What we're telling you is um, once you've identified who has um, a, a, which employee role has a heightened risk, um, from there you would then need to determine what level of um, integrity or, or competency needs to be um, or how you go about screening it. If you do come across um, a profile where um, you know the risk is too great, you as an organization need to determine what you need to do. Uh, we don't advocate firing people or not firing people. We, we remain silent on it. I think certain things that you can consider um, uh, is what controls can you put in place? Um, you know, will there be a double check for a person? Will there be um, no longer access to approve certain matters? Um, there's more than one way uh, to, to skin a cat, and that again talks to the heart of the risk based nature what kind of controls you can put in. Also, a reminder. Um, just because you are a high risk or your the employee role is being determined as a high risk, it doesn't mean that that person's done anything wrong. And I think you you made the point they haven't done anything wrong. The role is high risk. Whether I fill the role, whether you fill the role, whether my cousin fills the role, the role is a high risk, not the person who sits um, behind the high risk. Okay, and I think that's an important differentiator. All it means is because you hold that position, and it's similar to PEPs, because you hold the position. Of authority because you can make significant um, decisions because you can alter the regime of the organization from a, a money laundering and terrorist financing perspective we need to make sure um, that we you know that we um, that we're confident that you can do the job um, and that from a, an integrity perspective you probably won't be swayed all right so please just because it's a high risk role it doesn't mean anyone has done anything bad it just means the level of scrutiny is greater. And if you do, because um, not everyone's bad, it's just a very small portion. Um, and, and if you do find something, you know, take it on an ad hoc basis to make that risk-based decision. Okay, uh, do we treat foreign employees exactly like uh, South African employees? Yes, of course. Um, there was a slide um, that we spoke about. I'm just. I'm not going to share it because I have no idea how to do that right now in the mode that I'm in. Um, but when we were talking about enhanced um, integrity, we said um, as a national um, of a high risk terrorist financing or proliferation financing geographic area. So those are um, um, you know considerations that you would need to have a look at, especially in instances. Um, where they are a um, considered a high risk. So please don't get this wrong. This doesn't mean that every single um, foreign employee needs to now go through enhanced screening. If they fill a um, a high risk role, these are addi additional questions and additional searches that you can perform. It, it doesn't apply. It doesn't mean that any any employee whose husband is a pep or any person who holds a foreign citizenship now must go through this um, enhanced screening. If their role, that's where you start first. First, identify what are the roles that present a heightened risk, what are the roles that go medium, and what are the roles that go low. So for my low risk, I'm just going to do, I'm saying potentially, I'm not saying this is how you have to do it, um, but practically speaking, I'll do a, um, a criminal check and I might do, um, I can't list any service providers, but you know, I can do a, whatever check with through third party, or I can do it by myself um, versus a person who has a um, an employee role that's been identified as a high risk, then I still do that. I still do the criminal check. I still do the verification review. And then on top of that, I ask additional questions. Are you related to um, a politically exposed person? 
let me have a look at um, the jurisdiction that your your citizenship comes from. All right. So it's it's again, you need to apply those measures only where the employee role is a high risk. Okay. Um, must I sign into the site before doing any TFS searches? Um, so no, there's no um, login credentials. Uh, it's uh, so if you go onto the website. Um, and there's an internationals tab and then it says targeted financial sanctions. It takes you to a landing page. It's a very cool page because it tells you everything about who the United Nations is. What is a security council resolution? Um, so, in other words, why are these people on the lists? Um, because these lists do come from the United Nations and then it gets promulgated in our legislation. Um, it tells you the relevant sections. It gives um, access to the search functionality and you can print it. But there's there's no um, there's no login details for that, which I'm sure you're very happy about because there's one less password <laughs> for you to try and remember. Okay. Ah, oh, Rob Campbell gave us a compliment. Thank you, Rob. Sorry, I shouldn't have said your name. Sorry. Um, my name's Ashley Moy, so I'll put that out so then maybe you won't feel so bad. <laughs> Another question here. Um, certain accountable institutions perform batch screening on universal sanctions lists. However, the FIC TFS list is not a listed universal list on platforms such as Bleep and Bleep. Does the screening have to be performed manually for the onboarding of each employee? Um, which then includes head office staff, branch staff, et cetera. All right, so this is a very operational question, so I'm not too sure because I haven't really applied my, um, my mind to it. Um, but the rule, if I can just take you back to the rule. So for your current staff, I think that's um, that's a very easy set. If you want to run it through other service providers, remember that some service providers have the South African list, but then they also have a whole host of other lists. So they might have the, um, the Her Majesty's HMRC list. Uh, there might be the OFAC list. Um, so there's a whole bunch of other lists, including South Africa's list. So if you screen them against um, those lists and you're really paying for it and you really have it in place, you know, there's no issue. If someone's name, name pops up, it's not from a South African sanctions perspective, but that might be very useful for you as an organization to know that you might potentially have an employee on an OFAC list. So that's the only, um, maybe, it's not even a caution, it's just something that you need to be um, aware of. I don't think there's anything bad in knowing um, if they're on a different list. Then in terms of um, potential, oh, I beg your pardon, prospective employees. So I'm not too sure how that batch works. I don't know, you know, is, is it realistic that you have 50, 60 staff members starting at the same time or are they ad hoc? Um, but however that search is done, whether it be um, through batch every Friday through your HR or whether it be through, um, you know, one source searches, that's something that you would need to consider to build in um, so long as it's done before they start employment and then after employment will be much easier. They can always slot in to your, um, your, your client screening. If you've really got a client screening process in place, slot them in with that. Um, it's, it's the same lists. Okay, we missed the presentation regarding six and seven. Is it? Yes, yeah. So that's the recording that is on the, um, on the YouTube page. Uh, when will this presentation be available to watch? Uh, so today is Thursday. So maybe tomorrow, maybe Monday, um, tend to have a two day turnaround time now with, with this new platform. Is there a window period by when the screening should be completed as some of just, let me read that again. Is there a window period by when the screening should be completed? Oh, and I'm assuming as some just got registered recently. So I'm not too sure what this means. So I'm going to answer it in, in two ways because I'm thinking it might mean two things. Um, so either the question is the organization has just registered recently. So you might be someone from the new schedule items. Um, remember your if, if that is the case and you are um, like a credit provider or a, a, a jeweler for argument's sake and you, you're a new schedule item, your compliance obligation doesn't start the day that you register with the FIC. Your compliance obligation started um, from December last year, you had 90 days in which to register, which ended, I think, like the 21st or the 22nd of, um, of March of this year. Um, so technically, you're in a state of non-compliance. 
uh, the FIC did say that there's an 18 month period um, where we won't be focusing on administrative sanctions. We'd be rather focusing on on outreach and trying to get people to register with us. Um, but if that is what you mean, then you know <laughs> you need to you needed to have, um, start applying this from the first, 31st of March already. Uh, if you mean uh, employees have just gotten um, just gotten um, registered on your system, or you've just gotten uh, new employees, then they would then fall within your current employee database. Okay. Um, I may be just going to pause for one quick minute, A, to have a sip of water, um, but I do note that a lot of participants are dropping out. So maybe if um, uh, I can ask, and it's something that I should have asked already, if we could maybe take five minutes then, that you can fill in the questionnaire for us. Uh, there's 1,500 of you, and I would really, really ask um, as many of you as possible to please fill in the questionnaire. I'm not too sure if it has been posted um, to the comments. It's going to be posted in, ah, oh, everyone's leaving now, now that I said there's a test. Um, please, if you can fill in the link for us, um, and then we will carry on with the Q&A. We're not going to stop. Um, I'm just very keen to see how you found today's session. All right, I believe it has been posted. Um, it will be the, the last comment that has been posted by Michael. All right, so it's a very, it's a very quick, there's only like eight questions, nine questions. It's not, it's not rocket science. And I'll be with you in a minute. All right, so um, we do see a lot of you answering the questionnaire for us. Thank you so much. Um, so let me then carry on with the questions. Um, there was a question uh, that uh, the producers in the background are saying is coming through quite a lot, and that is around what is the nature of the role that needs to be um, uh, screened? So remember the directive refers to two things. It refers to um, screening for integrity and competence, and the other one talks to scrutinizing against a targeted financial sanctions list. Uh, the the scrutinizing of information is for all employees. It doesn't matter the role. Uh, when it comes to um, um, screening for integrity, it really talks to the nature of the role that's being um, that is um, that needs to be screened. All right. Um, what exactly is a is the RNCP, uh, that, that is actually a, a two hour session in and of itself, uh, which we actually have on our YouTube channel. But the RNCP is a risk management compliance program. Uh, it's covered in terms of section 42 of the FIC Act. Um, essentially what it is, it's your internal controls and it's the, it's, well, it's two things. It's the actual process that needs to be followed. So how do you practically apply a risk-based approach uh, and it also talks to the documentation um, of your processes. All right. So the first part of section 42 says, how do you as an organization um, identify, assess, manage, mitigate, and monitor your risk? 
And then the second part of section 42 then says, this is, um, you know, uh, it's kind of like indicators. Um, how do you conduct customer due diligence? How do you risk rate a client? How and when do you submit a report to the FIC? Um, sure, such a long list. How do you deal with pets? How do you keep your records? All right. So that's an RMCP document, very useful. There is a link um, in the presentation that you will be getting uh, during the course of tomorrow, which is today's presentation, uh, that has a link to a draft RMCP. Uh, it's not a copy and paste. You still need to apply your mind and understand, you know, what are your organization's processes? Um, what is the risk assigned to that? Um, and then you, you have to apply it. Okay, so that's a very short nutshell answer for what a what for what an RMCP is. Okay, uh, do you need to tell employees that you are going to screen them in accordance with the FIC and must this be brought in on the employee contracts? So we have issued a PCC, I think it's stand to be corrected, I wonder if it's 12A. Anyways, um, that talks to um, POPI considerations or privacy um, considerations. And what's important then, and again, we, we always try to link this to existing principles that are already in place. There's only a certain amount of things that you're not allowed to tell someone about. And first and foremost is SDRs, so the suspicious transaction reports, which isn't necessarily applicable in this particular instance. If you are going to be obtaining information, and this is a POPI principle, again, I'm not the POPI expert, um, but the general principle from a privacy legislation perspective is if I'm going to collect information, um, uh, there needs to be a reason why I'm collecting that information. Now, um, there is kind of a, a carve out, well, I don't want to call it a carve out, but there is um, um, a provision in POPI that says that where information is requested um, and there's like a legislative intent behind it, or there's um, a legislative provision that requires you to get that information, then you're entitled to do so, um, which is where the directive comes in. So you, you do have a positive obligation to do it. So therefore, yes, you do have a reason in law, um, a justifiable reason that allows you to obtain the data. What the PCC also says, the PCC also says is it's recommended that you do tell people that you are collecting their data and that you are um, using it for, um, you, you don't have to specifically say it for, you know, one, two, three, and four, but you can say full compliance with um, directives um, um, eight uh, and the and the FIC Act. All right. This, this there's no ducking and diving, and there's no secrecy around it, and there's no, um, you know, I wouldn't go around posting, you know, like everyone who sits in a red chair is is a high AML risk. It's it's just part and parcel um, of um, of the process. So there's nothing in the directive that prohibits you. There's no tipping off. Um, in fact, from a targeted financial sanctions perspective, so the scrutinizing obligation, um, it's purely factual. Are you on the list? Yes or no? It's, it's, and they'll know that they're on the list if they're on the list in any event. Um, and then from a scrutinizing perspective, uh, I don't think it's going to be um, that much of a concern because whenever you apply for a job, like I've done so recently, um, but you will give in your transcripts. You will, I mean, it's on your CV in any event. Okay. Uh, so, yes, very long winded answer, but you, there's nothing saying that you're not allowed to tell your employees. Okay. Um, does the screening also apply to a sole practitioner? <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that question. So, that, so, if you're the sole practitioner and it's only you, um, you are your employee. So, I guess technically it does apply to you. Um, but if you know you're not on the sanctioned list, um, yeah, I'll just leave that there. But yes, it's applicable to everyone. Okay, uh, I typed an employee ID number into the TFS list on your website and it came up, oh gosh, with a red result saying no results. Check your search keywords. Does this mean that the screening is clear or is it an error result? Hmm, I'm not actually too sure. Um, I don't know if there was anything else that maybe so sometimes if you um you know, if you click tab and you put a comma in a field, it might come up as an error. So I can't answer that exactly. Uh, but if there is something that comes up and tells you that there are no results, then that that's a, a report that says there are no results. All right. So it doesn't seem like you've done anything wrong. If you only typed in the um, the ID number, there's there's a few different fields as well that you need to complete. Um, so there's um, you know like name, surname, ID number, 
uh, capture as much information as you possibly can in there. Uh, and if it comes up with no results, then it means no results. All right. If you click on the export button, so there will be an option for you to, to actually print the receipt or to print the um, or download the record, the transcript of it. In there, it will give you a lot of detail around what it flagged on or what it didn't flag on. Okay, so that's the, um, yeah. If you need further help on this, please, you're more than welcome to call our call center and they can do the search with you, uh, see the results. And if it is just a case that there is no result, then they can help confirm that with you. Let them do that step by step so that you, you know for sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely you will get the slides. Um, okay. Um, the presentation for the 23rd, um, so the slides will be sent out. So again, the, the session that was held on the 23rd of May and the one that was held yesterday, uh, I beg your pardon, the day before yesterday, was on Directive 6 and 7, and that's the um, submission of your risk and compliance return. So unfortunately, the video for the 23rd is not going to be uploaded, but the video for the 30th has already been uploaded. It's the same presentation, it's the same content, it's just different speakers. Um, and those slides will also be sent out. The, the first set of slides should have already been um, sent out on the, uh, on the 24th or the 25th already. Please do check your, your junk mail, uh, especially because the events inbox sends multiple mails. Um, so whether it be around reminders to submit your risk and compliance return, whether it be an email for an event, um, sometimes your servers do block um, the event mailbox sent because it considers us a scam. Uh, so, you, you know, we know for sure that it goes out and we do get um, reports of um, how many people, you know, actually click and open it. So we also track and analyze that data in the back end. So maybe do check your, um, your spam folder. Okay, so still questions around um, um, informing personnel. I think we've already covered that. Do you inform them that you'll be screening them again? Yeah, that's nothing wrong with that. Um, on the associated with the PIP, is someone working for a political party deemed a PIP? Um, as one of our employees are in a relationship with this person, are they a PIP? Okay, I think we already covered that. But just, um, you know, if they are part of a political party, uh, I never read that provision. So if you have a look at um, Schedule 3A, 3A tells you from a domestic perspective who are all... Um, um, who are considered as uh, domestic PEPs. Uh, so it says a domestic PEP is someone who holds a position and what's important is once a PEP, always a PEP. Uh, and it's a person who's either the president or deputy president, <coughs> excuse me, a government minister or deputy minister, the premier of a province, a member of an executive council of a province, executive mayor, a leader of a political party, member of the royal family, head of an accounting or chief financial officer of a national, provincial, a municipal officer, um, and so it goes down. So in that particular instance, the, it seems to me, because I'm not quite too sure, where you say working for a political party, it depends. Um, so I work for um, uh, a government per se, um, but like my bosses are PEPs, but I'm not necessarily a PEP. So it really depends on, um, on, on what their role is um, in that organization, right? Remember, the person through association is not a PEP. And again, just to reiterate the point is, you don't now go ask every single person, you know, is your husband a PEP, is your wife a PEP? Um, it's understand, first, first and foremost, understand the employee role, understand who has a heightened risk employee role and who has employee role, a lower risk. The lower risk people, you can do your normal searches. The higher employee role, that's when you're going to start asking them additional questions, like who are you related to? Um, um, and what country do you come from? So those are the enhanced due diligence questions that are only required for roles that present a heightened risk. Okay. Um, that's actually a very interesting question. So the AML staff are the people who screen themselves. <laughs> that's a very interesting one. Um, and again, it's, it, it really depends on how this gets built into your, your structure. I would probably prefer, and this is Ashley talking, that this sits independent from your AML team. Um, and this is probably going to be part of your onboarding process. Um, it can be assisted by your HR division, tied in with um, business processes. What we always say is 
where there's an existing business process that is already serving the purpose, don't go and create a new process because that's not an effective use of um, resources and that's not what the risk-based approach is about. All right. Um, is there a free website for PEP screening to see if a high-risk employee is linked to a PEP? Uh, we do not have a South African database for PEPs or a foreign database for PEPs, but we do have a PCC uh, that explains the PEP principles in detail. Uh, and it also has some useful links in the PCC. Uh, the PCC also says, you know, if someone tells you, yes, my husband is a PEP, you don't need to go and validate that because, you know, <laughs> they've, already con they've already confirmed uh, that they are. However, on the flip side, if someone says no, there might be a, um, a particular instance that they are trying to, um, you know, circumvent the fact um, that they are associated, not for any negative reason per se, or it could be for a negative reason. And in that particular instance, there would be a, an obligation to at least do a little bit of digging uh, or some form of digging. But again, if they tell you yes, you don't need to confirm that that, you know, that, that yes is valid. Right. Um, is the list of institutions that needs to comply with the directive, is that available on the FSCA or the FIC website? So that would definitely be um, on the FIC website. It's all accountable institutions. So if you want to have a look at who is an accountable institution, you say the FSCA, so I'm assuming you might be a financial services provider. Uh, you guys can look at um, Schedule 1 to the FIC Act. Schedule 1 of the Act says who are all the accountable institutions. It goes from um, one all the way to 23. Uh, some of them have been removed in between. Uh, some of them have kind of, um, we've added one or two also in between, uh, but that is in the schedules to the FIC Act. All right. Um, never a silly question. There's only dumb answers. So this one says it might be a silly question, but there's a specific supplier or vendor that this additional screening can be done through, or is it something that must be drawn up by your own organization? All right. So um, again, for this, we don't we're deliberately silent on how you or what systems you make use of because we cannot um, endorse any third party service provider. Uh, we do have a, um, a PCC available on outsourcing of compliance obligations. So simply put, you can never outsource your obligation, but you can get assistance from vendors. So there's nothing that prohibits you from um, going out to get assistance. But if it's something that you can do um, in-house um, or, you know, you know, with engagement with the employee, if they can provide you with transcripts, a copy of the um, um, matric certificate or of the degree, whatever the case may be, that could be sufficient on your, um, you know, on the lower risk end. You might not, there's no, there's no verification. So it's not like your customer due diligence that says a high risk client, you have, sorry, stop playing with my pen. Um, a high risk client, you need to, you know, get more information, get more documentation. Um, that validation hasn't been built into the directive. So the higher end of the risk there, you might have to, or you might consider getting uh, third party database verifications, um, or you can, again, just ask the client, uh, the employee for transcripts. Um, I see we've still got 25 minutes left of the session and most of you have stayed. There was an exodus of about 200 people just now when I asked you to fill out the questionnaire. Um, I've got the time booked until 12 in any way. So um, if you have promised to fill out the questionnaire, then I will continue until um, <coughs> continue until 12 with the questions. Okay. Uh, just to confirm, we must also complete checks for current employees in roles that we identify as high risk not just new employees joining the business, definitely. Um, so the directive says prospective and current. Uh, for your current employees, uh, the PCC recommends first going through the post. So the process for everyone is first identifying which roles are a heightened risk, which roles would be more medium and which roles would be less of a risk. That's step number one. Step number two then is identifying who are the people that fulfill those roles, all right? And then you start performing it. You might have already done it to some extent. Um, so look at look at your employee record, see what information you already have available. Um, if if you have the information and it's sufficient, then you know it's it's, it's sufficient. Um, uh, from a scrutinizing perspective, you know that everyone has to get screened immediately or scrutinized against the targeted financial sanctions list. Um, and then you go to your lower risk clients, and then you need to remember there's that ongoing basis. 
So, you know, has anything changed? Has their role changed? Um, you know, do they um, do they now hold a criminal record? Okay. Um, is it possible to share a sample questionnaire for the screening process? Uh, so we don't have a, um, a questionnaire for the screening process, but I think what's quite important if you have a look. So when you look at the, the presentation and also if you have a look at the PCC, the PCC uh, very similar to the presentation says this is what competency is and these are the kind of questions that you can look at. This is integrity and the kind of questions that you can look at. So you can use that, but just please use it as a starting point. Uh, because the lists and the examples aren't exhaustive, there might be something um, like if you're an accountant or if you are an attorney, you know, you might want to make sure that they um, have been admitted to the bar or that they have passed whatever um, association or board exam. That might be relevant um, in your space. You know what I mean? So everyone's is going to be a bit different. Have a look at what's necessary for, for your organization or for your profession if you're in a profession. Um, are there any remedies or actions that need to be taken if you fail the scrutiny and the competency test? Uh, okay, so from a scrutiny perspective, uh, it, it's, it, it is an obligation, it's not a positive obligation, but it says no person may provide any form of financial support um, of, of any kind uh, to a person who's on a targeted financial sanctions list. So it, it is what it is. Um, that includes providing a salary, medical aid, whatever the case may be. So in that particular instance, I, I think that one is, is relatively clear cut. There are no South Africans on the list, just so you know. Um, and it's highly, highly unlikely that an employee is on the list. And the reason why I say that is, um, you know, from a, um, from a South African perspective, we can see the report, well, not me personally, but the FIC, can see the reports um, coming through and they refer to as a TPR or a terrorist property report. Now, a terrorist property report is submitted by an AI, which you would know because you're accounts for institutions, and this is where someone has, uh, a client of theirs has flagged on the list. Now, think about it, all of your employees, you generally, in most instances, you pay money into their bank account. If they were a, a person on the TFS list, chances are good that they would have probably been flagged by, um, by the bank. I'm not saying, therefore, that means no one else um, or everyone is exempt now because, you know, the banks do it. The, bank, the banks can't do everything for everyone. That's part of their checks. All I'm saying is it's, it is highly unlikely that you would have someone. All right. Uh, and then we obviously can't discount the, uh, the, the possibility of you paying someone cash uh, or you paying into a third-party bank account. Um, and the reason why they do that is because they know they're on the list, so they give you someone else's um, someone else's bank account details to pay into. All right, if they fail their scrutiny or the integrity test, again, we, we're not very, uh, we're deliberately silent on that. Based on a risk-based approach, um, what can you do? How can you remedy it? Uh, I think competency is an, an easy one. If you find that the person isn't competent, um, but from an integrity perspective, amazing. Well, then send them on a short course. Um, you know, send them on training, upskill them. This isn't a, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a ticket to get rid of people. Um, I think it's an amazing learning opportunity to try upskill people. Um, and I think, you know, if, if anything, you get a fully competent AML team, then, then I think the director was serving its purpose. Right. Um, yes, definitely screening against the sanctions list is for absolutely everyone, all right? And not only your, um, your, your different risk from an AML perspective. Okay, um, should we also screen our directors? Yes, everyone. Um, how do we determine who is a PEP or a PIP? That is according to the schedule. So schedule 3A is for domestic PEPs, schedule 3B is for um, foreign PEPs, and 3C, which is a, a recent addition, is for politically influenced person or influential persons. Okay, just to confirm with the effective date being the 31st of March, if an employee left on the 1st, um, on the 1st of April, do they still need to perform the screening? I'm going to give you a regulator's answer. The regulator said from the 31st. Um, yeah. Um, is there a tool you can recommend in terms of screening? Um, unfortunately, we don't do any form of product endorsements, um, so we wouldn't be able to, to recommend. Um, what I can, however, say is, oh, so that was for screening, sorry. 
for the scrutinizing, the scrutinizing is an easy one because the tool is on our website and you can use it for free. Uh, you don't have to use a, uh, a tool for screening uh, necessarily. Um, we're, not, we're not expecting people to go out and now sign deals with vendors or purchase systems. Uh, be creative, get the information um, from the employees, see what free um, search uh, options you have, or maybe your HR already performs certain searches and already has contracts with different service providers. Maybe have a look and tap into what's already there and what's already being requested so that you don't have to, you know, double that burden. Um, yes, the recording will be shared. The presentation will be sent out. Um, there was a request for contact numbers. I do see uh, Michael had posted um, our contact details. There's also you can send through a, um, a query through on the website if you would like to. Uh, where must the records be kept in the employee file or in a separate file? Uh, again, we don't um, we don't indicate that. What we do indicate, however, and this is maybe something that you would need to consider, uh, if we do come out or if one of your, um, I'm not too sure what industry you might be from, so if the FSCA or the Reserve Bank or the FIC come and do an inspection uh, and we, we do a thematic inspection, which means we can decide what theme we're going to come in and test, Say now we come in and we want to do a directive, a directive eight test, and we want to check your employee files. Uh, you would need to know where those files are, and you would need to know what the rule is regarding that. So we strongly recommend um, it being dictated in your RMCP. So there is a record keeping obligation in the RMCP in terms of clients. And that's why we say we recommend that you also include employees within that. Because again, the processes are probably going to be either identical or very similar, and you're going to be making use of the same tools, but it needs to be easily accessible when the fit gets there. It can be um, uh, stored in the cloud, it can be virtual. Um, there's no need for you to keep hard copy files of anything. Um, is there a deadline for screening current employees? Um, so there isn't a deadline, and I'm going to be honest when we sent out the draft for consultation. Initially, there was a thinking of saying that it needs to be within a six month period um, based off of all the comments that we received and based off of <clears throat> you know, the urgency of um, fixing the, the issues that were identified in the mutual evaluation report and the associated action items. Uh, we weren't in a position to, to push out compliance by six months. So when the directive was issued, it was issued um, and took commence and it in, was enforceable from the 31st of, um, of March. So there's no deadline, but there was definitely a starting point, um, which means essentially that it, it needs to have been done or in progress. Okay, remember, start with your high risk clients first. Okay. Um, There was a question about how do you con how do you <laughs> reconfirm someone's um, education? So I would like to think you know if um, part of that competency check was you know if you have a master's degree and they provided you with proof of their master's degree and you know in three years time when you're doing a review on the on the um, on the slow risk employee, there's no need to ask for stuff that's already there. Um, it become it can become um, a little bit easier in the sense of has anything changed? Um, have you done any additional courses? What short courses have you gone on? Uh, and this is why I say it's so important that you partner with HR because Jen, all your learning and development, uh, and I know every organization has different names, but oftentimes the organization as part of their um, social responsibility to their staff already have these programs in place. It might be in-house training. Uh, they might send you on courses. They might issue bursaries. So HR might already have all of this information available in any ways. Uh, it's also something that can be built into the performance development plans. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so each company should have a policy that defines who they consider high risk, et cetera, and why. Definitely. A absolutely, definitely. You can't decide one day, um, you know, everyone who sits on this side is high risk and that side is low risk. It needs to, there needs to be thought behind it. Um, there's, there's no technically wrong or right answer if you can show that you've applied your mind um, and you understand why these people are high risk. And remember, it's the role, it's the employee role that is the risk. So any person who comes in 
you can't now exclude that person because you don't think that they're a high risk. It's around the, the role that they fill that determines the risk. Okay. Um, there's a question, does it include certain other country presidents? So if you're looking for um, the, the list on who is a foreign politically exposed person, um, so of any country for a foreign prominent, um, I beg your pardon, a foreign politically exposed person, it says the head of state um, or the head of a country or a government. So for any country, um, the president would be considered a, um, a foreign pip. Okay. Uh, there are a number of databases available in the market. Okay, we've already discussed, unfortunately, we're not in a position to, um, to vet um, any form of third parties. Okay. Um, where can I get an actual list for the high TFP of geographic areas? So there isn't a South African specific list. Um, there are, however, um, indicators that can lead you to um, determining a list. In the presentation, you'll see that there is a PCC that talks to it. And in there, there are several links that we make reference to. So there's links like Transparency International, um, the, the Fraud Risk Indicator or Index, um, the EU also has a list of high risk countries, which interestingly enough, um, as of the 17th of, um, what's before June, May, the 17th of May, uh, South Africa is actually deemed a high risk third party country, um, which doesn't obviously now mean that we need to make ourselves high risk, but there, there are different lists available and those lists are, um, or those links rather, are in that PCC, which is in the presentation. Okay. Um, Right, so I see a lot of you are still staying for the Q and A. Uh, we've got twelve minutes left, so we can keep going. Um, if you screen against the UN consolidated list, will you be covered in terms of TFS screening? Uh, so not the UN consolidated list, but the targeted financial sanctions consolidated list. Uh, I know it's semantics, but um, we first need to promulgate the um, the lists into a South African context. Um, which happens kind of automatically now with the recent changes to, to our legislation, because again, that is one of the, the FATF principles that you need to implement the sanctions listings um, immediately and without delay. So it really is a fast turnaround time. Um, but we also have um, certain lists. So the UN has multiple lists, um, not necessarily always on um, targeted financial sanctions. Our listing is specific to targeted financial sanctions, all right? And not, not the other listing options that there are. So much like if you are using a foreign database, um, there were examples provided of different um, databases used, uh, you would probably meet all of the South African lists uh, and then some, uh, which would be the other countries' um, listings. But just use the free tool on the FIC website. Um, we're very proud of it and it really does work. Okay. Um, Just trying to find more questions. Um, I think <laughs> shame people were experiencing load shedding story of our lives. Uh, but yes, the our recordings, so we don't go down, um, or our offices don't go down during load shedding. We've got generators, so uh, the session on our side is uninterrupted. I don't even know if there was load shedding. Um, yeah, so the presentation will definitely still go out, even if you had a cut uh, in transmission. Okay. I'm just looking through some of the questions. A lot of the questions we've already um, we've already covered. Do we need to check employees who have been with the company of ten years and that just demonstrated the integrity? And competence over and over again, and I think that's definitely um, part of the part of the test. It can also be part of um, your risk-based approach. So if you do have an employee and they have been there um, and they've you know set up certain structures and they actually lead training initiatives, you know those are all things that go into um, having assessed that profile. The role itself is what determines the risk. Is how that person has performed. We only give examples. Um, we don't um, we don't say exactly how it needs to be done. So if internally um, this person, like you say, has demonstrated it, how have they demonstrated it? Um, and that needs to be put on record. 
because remember if anyone and i'm not saying you're only doing it because there is a, um, an, a you know an inspection that could take place but you need to be able to demonstrate how you got to that decision okay um What does a criminal contravention mean? <clears throat> okay, so again, wherever words haven't been defined um, explicitly in guidance or a directive, it would be the normal um, dictionary meaning that, um, that applies. And again, whether it be an actual um, conviction, whether it be someone who is being charged, um, you know, it's, it's not really our place or your place as an employer to make that determination of have they been convicted or not. And that's specifically why we didn't use the word conviction. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was either um, still in drafting stage where we had that word or it went through consultation. Uh, and there were very many, many comments um, around that. Um, so even if it is not a conviction, um, even if it's, um, you know, still pending, it, it, it need, you know, it, it's, it's information that you have available and it's information that you have an understanding of what controls you might need to put in place without, of course, ostracizing the, the employee, okay. um, which again is why the FIC is very silent on, um, you know, what is what is the consequence? So yes, they have flagged. It's up to you to determine what kind of controls you need to put in place. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I think I've gotten pretty much to the top of the list. I'm maybe gonna start at the bottom of the list again to see if there's any new questions um, that have come in. Okay, so there's a uh, it doesn't really relate to to the topics. I'm just going to have a look at the. Um, okay, so there's a question: If someone's had a conviction and their names were cleared, would they be considered as a high risk? Um, how would you approach the situation if they are acting suspicious? So again, remember it's it's only you only have a look at this um, information dependent on the roles, um, and 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 I I do feel like I'm, I'm maybe not being super helpful if people keep asking the question, um, but it really is up to you to determine what you do with that information. So if someone um, um, you you mentioned they were convicted, they've had their name cleared. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what you mean by they have had their name, um, had their name cleared. But anyways, it, that would tell you what kind of control you need to put in place to manage and mitigate that risk. So if that employee was convicted and they were an employee and they've been an employee for 10 years, uh, they have had their name cleared. Um, you know, I must, there, there must have been some level of enhanced scrutiny or some control put in place and things like controls. And I know we throw the terms around loosely. But it can really be things like, well, um, if there's a heightened risk, there needs to maybe be a double check in place. Um, maybe they shouldn't have access to have a final step um, in a process. So if they are approving transactions, they aren't the one who's allowed to validate a transaction, but they would be the one, you know, to, to process and get a double check or, or whatever the case may be. It really depends on the scenario um, and it, it depends on, um, you know, on, on what your findings are. Doesn't mean you must fire people. That's not at all what the directive um, is saying. All right, so I think we have now actually gotten to to the end. Um, there are so many questions that have come through and so many participants today, um, but I, I think we've, we've got a good feel for most of the questions. There's a lot of um, questions that we didn't answer because um, they weren't really related to today's topic, um, but there definitely are going to be more sessions that we are going to be hosting. So I may be going to pause it there um, and just take the opportunity now to thank everyone for your time. Um, again, a reminder, the presentations are going to be sent out. Please give us until tomorrow or maybe Monday. Um, tomorrow's Friday, okay, so you won't get it Friday. We don't send stuff out on a Friday. Um, we've been asked in the past by yourselves not to. Um, so we will probably send it then to you on, um, on Monday morning. The video will be available on the website. For those of you who are worried about the Directive um, 6 and Directive 7 submissions, uh, just a reminder, please, that yesterday was the due date for Directive 6. The portal is still open. Please, 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 please submit it. Um, have a look at that um, uh, video that is available on YouTube. 
have a look at Annex A. Annex A is a copy of all the questions that you are going to be asked when you go online. I really do strongly recommend that you look at the Annex A first, see what the questions are, answer it on the sheet, and then um, convert those answers onto the online submission. We can only accept submissions online. We won't be accepting any paper-based submissions. All right, so I really think that that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, we've got a whole host of sessions. We are starting our in-person sessions soon. Um, so for those of you in the different provinces, um, our road shows will be commencing in about two or three months. Uh, and I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic to be able to see you all in person. So that's it. All the very best. Keep well and God bless. Cheers all.